MegCram.com. Welcome to another MegCram COVID-19 update. Here we can see the dashboard for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. And if we click on this link here, Critical Trends, and click on Have States Flatten the Curve, what we see here is a really nice virtual map, if you will, of the United States. And you can see where the hotspots are here, currently Arizona. If we click on that, we can see here the graph, and you can see how serious this is here in Arizona. And the way to look at this is to see whether or not cases over a two-week period of time are going down or going up. And if they are going up, you can see an orange hue to it. If they're going down, you'll see a green hue to it. We'll take a look at some of these here. If we go back out here, we can see some of the states that are actually improving. We can look at, for instance, New York. And we can see very nicely that the number of cases have been decreasing here for the last couple of weeks. If we go to Massachusetts next door, we also see a similar pattern. If we go to Florida, we can see that cases are increasing there. And the other two hot spots are California, where we can see that cases are dramatically increasing. And I'm too keenly aware of that. But we can also see that here in Idaho, where cases have started to increase. And if we look at Texas as well, we can see here that cases are also increasing pretty dramatically. And if we go to our Worldometer website, we can see here with daily new cases in the United States. And if we look at the seven day moving average, we can see that that has taken a definite increase here over the last week or so. However, if we look at daily deaths in the United States and we look at the seven day moving average, Clearly, there's been a consistent decrease since that time. Of course, there could be a number of reasons for this, including the average age of the population being infected, the fact that there is a bit of delay between when someone dies and when someone gets infected with coronavirus could also mean that the virus could be weakening, that we could be also improving our care in terms of hospitalizations because of new medications that have come out could be the summertime, there could be more vitamin D. I mean, there's a number of reasons why this could all be. We don't know exactly what the reason is or if this trend is even going to continue. The other thing that you can do back on the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center homepage is go to testing here at the top. And under the testing, you can click on a particular state. And you can see here different graphs. We can see about in terms of new cases and we look at the seven day average. If it's green, it's coming down. If it's orange, it's going up. Test per 1,000 people and percent positive. And typically they wanna keep the percent positive around 5% or less based on the recommendations. And you can see which of the states currently are falling in that range and which ones are not falling in that range at a quick glance. In terms of what's going on out there in the vaccine world, don't forget to check out RAPS as well, which is keeping track of the COVID-19 vaccines. And there's an update here with some preprint papers for the Oxford vaccine that is showing some promising results, at least in the first phases of the vaccine development. There's also some updates in terms of all of the vaccines as you can see here, they update June 25th to include new information about the following companies. So this has been an interesting week for treatment in the COVID patient. It's been about the fourth straight week that I've been in the COVID unit, and I've been able to see treatment recommendations being used for patients, being able to implement in real time the recommendations of steroids. I think it's too early to tell whether or not it works. Of course, anecdotal evidence is pretty weak. But there seems to be some reaction now. We're getting the WHO, according to NBC News here, updating COVID-19 clinical guidance, stressing that steroids should not be used as prevention. They say here it's exceptionally important that this drug is used under medical supervision. It's pretty important that patients do not take steroids unsupervised at home. There's a lot of complications, a lot of dangerous, potentially fatal complications that can occur if people start taking steroids without supervision, none of the least of which is if you take steroids for more than two weeks and then all of a sudden stop it, 
there is a potential chance of adrenal insufficiency, which could be fatal. And the longer you take steroids and stop them all of a sudden, the more dangerous and likely it could be that you could have adrenal insufficiency. This is not to mention the side effects that occur with long-term steroid use, such as osteoporosis, erosion of the stomach lining, diabetes, thinning of the skin, cataracts, etc., etc. So really, what we're talking about here is supervised use in the hospital, typically for no more than 10 days to help patients with COVID-19 who are hypoxemic or on the ventilator. Again, we wait for the peer-reviewed article, which will probably appear in a major publication here in the next few weeks. We did give you the link in the last update to the preprint released from the recovery trial in the UK out of Oxford. And I did want to thank one of our viewers for passing along this information to us in case you thought that there was no way to connect the steroid wing here to the vitamin D wing. Well, you're wrong, because here's a paper that was published almost 10 years ago, which solidifies the connection that shows that dexamethasone, yes, the very same medication that was used in the recovery trial that showed a statistically significant benefit in mortality in COVID-19 patients, yes, that same dexamethasone has been shown to enhance the active metabolite of vitamin D, which is 1-alpha-25-dihydroxyvitamin D3, otherwise known as calcitriol. It does enhance its activity by increasing the transcription of the vitamin D receptor. So the receptor that accepts that vitamin D, usually inside the cell that goes into the nucleus that causes transcription of other factors, has been shown to be increased by dexamethasone. Just to warn you, this is a very, very technical paper. If you want to look at it, it is published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, and it is not light reading in the least. They do prove the point pretty effectively that dexamethasone regulates the vitamin D receptor at the transcriptional level, and it does increase it. Now, whether or not this is associative or whether or not this is any relation to why there is an association with patients with COVID-19 and vitamin D levels and the fact that this very same medication, dexamethasone, improves survival, we don't know that at this point, but it is certainly interesting and it's certainly a dot that needs to be put on the paper to see whether it gets connected at some point down the line. Of course, there are other groups that are also looking at vitamin C. There's Paul Merrick's group out of Eastern Virginia and the Math Plus protocol, which I think has merit. And of course, that raises a bunch of other questions that we could ask about a bunch of other protocols and things of that nature. So interesting week as we wrap up. Wanted to remind you that we are still planning on doing a live session on Sunday evening, 6 o'clock Pacific time. We've got some interesting articles to cover next week. But if you want to join Kyle and myself for a live video stream and answering your questions, whether it be about COVID-19 or any other medical disease or whether or not it's my personal experience with COVID-19 patients, we will be available 6 o'clock Pacific time. Until then, please come and see us at medcram.com for clear explanations on over 60 different medical topics. Thanks for joining us.